My name is Peter Young, and uh, I'm a member of the Committee 100 and also CEO of Younger Partners at Investment Bank. And I really want to welcome all of you to, uh, to this 11th uh, Committee 100 Asian American Career Ceilings webcast. Uh, we started this in February of 20, uh, 2020. And uh, originally we were going to have a live conf a conference, but that obviously was postponed. But we really had now a number of different webcasts covering different parts of this issue, whether we people who are experts who have the data or people who have served in government who talk about government or people who are millennials. We really try to essentially convene people who can help all of us understand better what the issues are, how bad it is, and what can be done to solve the problem. I have a special, uh, I have a special uh, uh, love for tonight's uh, webcast because we have two wonderful people, both of whom I know well, who have been fabulous in their careers, but also really uh, will be able to help all of you uh, understand the issues of the you know, Asian American career ceiling in the arts and museum management. Um, obviously, this issue has, has always been a problem, but obviously it's probably a bigger problem today with all of the Asian uh, hate kind of incidents and, and, and racism. So let me just briefly explain to you how this is going to happen. Uh, we're going to end promptly uh, at the uh, at 7:30 East Coast time, and I'm going to lead our two panelists through a series of questions uh, for the first 40 minutes or so. And we want to make sure that we leave uh, 10 or 15 minutes at the end for questions from the audience. Now, <clears throat> in terms of asking questions, that's very easy. Uh, there are two functions. Uh, one is the chat function, and the other is the Q&A function, both of which essentially do the same thing. If you type in your question, both the panelist and I uh, can see the question and we'll try to answer as many uh, as we can. Uh, so uh, uh, the last thing I want to mention is the 12th uh, webcast will be on April 27th, and it's going to be on the issue of what are the driving factors and especially uh, ethnic, Asian ethnicity. And we have two leading professors who've done six different research studies on this issue. And they're gonna examine what is driving uh, the, the differences and are there differences, whether it's East Asian or South, uh, you know, uh, Southeast Asian uh, ethnicities. So with that, I'd like to lead off by having our two panelists take a minute or so and really just briefly talk about the key points in their career, uh, you know, in their, in their career trajectory. Nancy, you want, would you like to start? I should defer to Jay, but I'll start because you called on me, Peter. Um, Peter, it's so wonderful that you do this series. And I wish I had it when I was early in my career to, uh, to um, visit and learn from. Um, thanks everyone for joining. Um, I'm acknowledging the rawness of, it, of the day and the situation that we face in this country. Uh, and I will try to just say that and then get to the content at hand. Um, you, you know, I just more recently realized that there probably has been um, imposter syndrome in my career. Um, I'm 48 years old lately. I've been saying exactly how old I am because I think it's important in the context of career and career trajectory. And I guess I've been a utility player. So I've always looked at US China, Chinese American, Asian American, uh, from, from college onward. And I've been in these spaces where I've done it in many different sectors. Uh, but right now I'm the president of the Museum of Chinese in America. And despite the sort of stereotypes that investment banking at Goldman Sachs or you know, foreign policy think tank at Council on Foreign Relations or a startup hedge fund equity research shop are difficult jobs, I'd like to suggest that this is for me the most difficult job I've had in my entire career. And I can go into that a little bit more in our conversation, but it's really a pleasure to be here. And thank you to all of you who have uh, tuned in. Jay? Hello, hi, Peter. Hi, Nancy. Uh, delighted to be participating in this panel. I want to echo Nancy's acknowledgement of the gravity of the situation we are facing right now 
in terms of a rampant anti-Asian racism and violence. And I want to uh, encourage all of us to do our utmost in fighting and, uh, and uh, in uh, claiming the rightful place that the Asian American community should have in this nation. And I just want to mention uh, that I'm a first generation immigrant. I spent my last 30 years in the United States. And throughout my career, I have been a museum professional starting back after college graduation in Shanghai, working for the Shanghai Museum there. So I've been in the museum field for about 40 years and uh, with the first seven in China and the rest in this great nation. Despite, you know, tremendous uh, deep faults that our nation has. I really, my career was made here. So I want to acknowledge a sense of gratitude that uh, from uh, my American journey in terms of uh, uh, the uh, ability to uh, succeed to some measure, but also I want to be very blunt about the fault, the fault lines of our nation, of our society, and the long-standing ugly history of uh, racism and how we can do better. Sometimes my friends kid me that, Jay, you only know when to do one kind of job, that's a museum job, because that's all you do. I say, you're right. But on the other hand, I may dare to say that museum is really a hub of humanity because we're here to serve people from all walks of life. Everybody goes to museum. And we also serve people throughout the economic ladder. So I think uh, this is why in these two dimensions, I can dare to say museum is a hub of humanities. So my pleasure and my learning journey is to be able to interact with so many people. So I hope my American journey will be of some use to our audiences and I'm really looking forward to hearing from you that how I can grow and, uh, and uh, do a better job that I'm doing now. So thank you. So let's start. I, I, I think this first question is an important one. Uh, the, the Asian American career ceilings problem is a serious one in this country, although obviously it also depends upon uh, what profession. In some cases, it's almost disastrous. Others, it's a problem, but not a big problem. How serious do you feel that this uh, Asian American career ceiling problem is in the US in this area of arts and museum management? Either one of we you can speak. <laughs> See, the problem is you're both too polite. <laughs> you want to do whatever we should do. Yeah, Peter, you call on us. <laughs> oh, okay, all right. Uh, so Nancy, you start, and then okay. we'll, we'll reverse it next time for Jay. <laughs> okay, that sounds good. Um, and again, Jay, such a pleasure to be with you, and I'm already learning so much from the way you express yourself. Uh, I, the, the limitations uh, for growth and for leadership in the arts and cultural, from my perspective, uh, are extreme. Um, and again, just committing to frankness and openness about my own uh, life and trajectory. If I had had a choice where I felt like I could have had a measure of success, I would have definitely pursued um, arts and culture from the beginning of my career. Um, I was a theater minor. Uh, I always loved um, uh, you know, you know, visiting museums. I, I loved the cultural sector. Um, all my money was saved up to see one Broadway play when I was young. I often went by myself. Uh, I think the expression of one's journey and one's content through the arts and the presentation of arts and the creative display of exhibits is just, to me, one of the most spectacular um, pleasures one can have. Um, but I did not do that. Um, I felt immediately as a practical American born Chinese with immigrant parents that I should pursue something that was definitely safer. Have I looked back on my career and thought, why didn't I take a higher risk and perhaps gotten a higher return? Absolutely. If I had pursued as violently a career in the arts and culture as I did in, in investment banking, would I uh, you know, be at a different place today as I think about my personal satisfaction with my career? Perhaps. Um, do I feel like, again, I've been a high functioning utility player in many different sectors? Yes. Um, and it, it's, 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 a, it's a conundrum for me. 
like, why is it that, you know, some people think that entering Goldman Sachs investment banking is such a hard, difficult barrier to entry? Absolutely is. But at the same time, why did I foresee entering arts and culture to be even a more difficult, higher barrier to entry? And I think that's for two specific reasons. One is lack of exposure. The only museum that I ever went to with my parents growing up was uh, the Palace Museum in Taipei. And we spent way too long there. <laughs> that's a surefire way to get someone pretty tired of running a museum, but amazing, amazing collection. Um, and I think the lack of exposure is something that you become just unfamiliar with. And the lack of exposure is also role models who look like you. And that story has been told many times throughout different sectors. The second thing is the barrier to entry in terms of actually practical experience and internships. It was let, very let impossible. Ask, yeah. Let, let me interrupt you though. You know, sure. rather focus on sort of your career shifts, but more structurally among, you know, the museums, Absolutely. are there structural barriers internal for the success Absolutely. of Asian Americans, whether it's Asian museum themed museums or not, right? And that's, I think, you know, when I came to the museum in Chinese America, there was a comment that, um, why would you do that? I heard that a few times, that it was less than, um, and I think sometimes when we're looking at uh, cultural museums that actually tell uh, more marginalized uh, journeys and stories, there is this perhaps unspoken discount that's made. Um, but at the same time, I think the rigor of it, just because there aren't that many museums and these are smaller cultural treasures in this country, it's difficult to be exposed to um, some of those opportunities. Less than 1% of Asian Americans um, from the latest poll go into arts and culture. Um, when if, if you were to get, obtain an internship in certain some of the most renowned cultural institutions, there are very limited slots. If you don't get an internship in a, a reputable media, how would you possibly get a full-time job? And this is really more the trajectory before. I think things are changing right now, but I think the stepping stones for um, positions at some of the larger culturals are limited because the stepping stones are so few and far between. And if you yeah. don't have access to those stepping stones, then it's very difficult to actually go forward. Jay, again, how serious do you think uh, the, uh, the, the barriers for Asian Americans in arts and museum management, regardless of what type of museum or what type of arts uh, uh, organization? Um, I'd like to actually, uh, first of all, make a comment is that your question particularly addressed both art and the management. Right. And other professional in other tracks of uh, work is different from the professionals in the management. The second, at the risk of sounding simplistic, I would like to differentiate between the grassroots arts organizations that to nurture the development in communities, which is some of them are very vibrant and they are very passionate art professionals, leaders engaging that. Then there is institutionalized uh, um, the, the uh, sort of the sphere of arts organizations such as large museum, you know, largest being the Metropolitan Museum of Art. And in that category, the barrier is steep because the institute, large scale institutionalized art organizations have traditionally been among the most elitist organizations in our country. Let me just be very blunt about it. When I was appointed director of Asia Art Museum, I would only Chinese American who ever become a director of a major US art museums. And I still feel very lonely. There's still very few of them. And there's a various reason, one of which is cultural reasons. Your traditionally Asian American communities is marginalized, is always on the margin. And the second is also, I think the, 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 the I would say the barrier of number. So on the one hand, is the, as we say, typically we vote with our wallet. You know, the money does influence a lot of things. And, uh, you know, traditionally, institutionalized arts organization demands, depend tremendously on philanthropy. Yeah. Right. So that's how the economics works. And the second is that the amount of Asian Americans, I also must say that we don't have a large enough hand that's to Nancy's point. So, so few people going to ask profession, even fewer going so you, to you, ask you, 
so so basically you you're you citing a couple of things one is that because of the economic nature of these organizations and all the as, cultural yeah yeah uh, you, that obviously that influences the choices as to who ends up in leadership positions but you're also saying that it's partly for whatever reason asian americans have something to do with it because that not that many pursue it you know, and, and why do you think that they don't? And that's actually a, sort of a self-created problem. You can't blame that on the museums, right? Or the arts, if people don't try to enter, right? Uh, you know, why is it that both of you feel that uh, Asian Americans don't try to, to succeed in these organizations or enter these organizations? So I will say that the Museum as a mechanism, as a cultural ecosystem, should certainly be hold, be held accountable. You know, there's no doubt about it. I mean, this is why we're working so hard on diversity, equity, inclusion, and accessibility. That said, you know, of course, I you know think particularly um, even though I was the first immigrant, uh, first generation immigrant, came to this country, I could imagine and far better circumstances than the first generation of Chinese immigrate to America. Right. Putting food on the table, make a living so that your kids could have a better generation and then they can move on. Right. You know, I mean, it is a truth, like the second president of the United States, John Adams say, you know, the reason I go into uh, the, the, the uh, business or you know, so that uh, uh, my kids could go into law or something like that. And then their kids can go into art and, um, and, and the humanities. But I think in our generation, we're in the 21st centuries. Art must be made a very um, worthy cause, not only a livelihood, but also tremendous value for our common good. I think our society fundamentally put less value to the artistic production. And well, I think- part, So part of it- the Capitalism we have need to have a new reckoning to really put fair value to the artistic production. So you think that part of it is a, as a bias, an ethnic bias that it doesn't favor the, the arts, uh, I say as a career, I guess, you know, as opposed to being a doctor or something like that, right? Let's switch topics now to more your own careers. And can each of you think of an example of a career ceiling issue that you can cite that either affected you or someone you know well in the you know arts and museum management, and and how did it get resolved or did it get resolved? So we'll we'll start reverse now, Jay. Oh, okay. Um, first of all, you know, I, I want to make a disclaimer. You know, I love my job. This is my dream job <laughs> in San Francisco. But that said, there were career ceiling, and I'm going to be very blunt about it. You know, before I came to this job 13 years ago, I was the chairman of two departments in the Art Institute of Chicago, allegedly largest art museum, a second largest art museum only next to the Met. So I was the chairman of the Asian art department. I was also the chairman of the ancient department, which is ancient Mediterranean culture, Greek and Rome, Egyptian. So arguably I was in charge of more cultural civilizations than anybody else in my peer. Well, the Asian Art Museum is one kind of museum because you know Asian art is our focus. There are so many more general museums. And if you look at 30 years ago, my career standing, my seniority, I yield to very few people in my career, in our field. Yet when people are searching for director of a general museum, do they consider me? Or when they consider me, I cannot tell because behind the scene, you know, right. at the wedding, right. I went home. But does anybody knock on my door? Right. No. That is a career ceiling. Right. Somehow they feel, you know, you're Asian, you're Asian specialist. Great, you run Asian museum. Yet for a general museum, sometimes, oh, you're only Asian specialist. Let's not forget, Asian art is made by the population, 60% of world's population. Yeah. And it's on the other side, when a white Caucasian museum director, before he become one, typically is also a specialist in some area. Yet, if you are a Renaissance art, art historian, this does not seem to bother anybody that you can run a museum that also includes Asian art. 
vice okay. and reverse, yeah. you so have enough. Then so the clear, yeah, so clearly there is that bias. And, you know, obviously one of the issues across all these professions is this issue of people getting, pro, you know, how many people get promoted because they're head of, quote, Asia for a company or something versus people ending up the CEO of the whole company, which may be global. And this is also, you know, a, an issue where, where a lot of people get shunted off to, quote, be the Asia expert, right? Rather than give the opportunity to be the general uh, manager of, of, a, of a museum. Nancy, can you cite some examples, either your own personal examples or people you know well, uh, you know, in, in, in the profession? Yeah, I, I just echoing um, what, you, what you just said, Peter, it's a positive stereotype as well when you're in place into a cultural museum where, or you should be, because you're of Asian ancestry, you're the head of the Asian market or the Asian museum or the Museum of Chinese in America. And yet the question is, are those skills transferable? And I think one interesting thing that Jay alluded to, and I think I do represent more of that grassroots organization, although MOCA is going onto the platform of the uh, National Museum, uh, hopefully within a handful of years, uh, but the idea of the backdoor. And I think that that's really interesting, the backdoor through management, through financials, through operations, you also see more Asian Americans than in the art creation and art curation part of it. But similarly, doing a backdoor office back ops position in any sector and going to the front line of any sector is a huge jump. Mm -hmm. um, and I think the ceiling that you've seen is the self-imposed ceiling that, well, I can do the utility job. I can do the financial ops and management utility job, but maybe I'm not good enough to do the creative artistic expression, expression job, which has a higher risk investment, um, but that's always been a hobby. I was always a hobby artist. I was always, and yet the lack of affirmation within our own perhaps familial structures, society limits our ability to believe that we can actually succeed on the front line of this sector as well. And what we end up doing often, you see a lot more Asian Americans doing the financial section, the operations and the management section. So I think what we, the, the ceiling that we actually see is in some ways also self-imposed. And just going back to the internship, I think internships are so important. That's why that's one of the first things we did at MOCA when I started here six years ago is to create an internship program so that we could take all of our interns every week to every major museum in the New York City area, give them that portfolio of exposure and work within a museum so that they could use it as a stepping stone. Do we want them to work at MOCA in 10, 20 years? Not necessarily. We would love to see them at the Asian Art Museum, at the Met, at MoMA, at PS1, at at Guggenheim, wherever it might be, and they could take that as a stepping stone. But what we very much saw was that there was no stepping stone. There were well, you know, six. Yeah, yeah. No, I, 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 let me, go ahead, Jay. Uh, I totally agree with uh, Nancy. I think internship is a very useful tool because we must start early. We must broaden the field and our candidate pool. And even the interns ended up not doing the arts or arts management job. That's fine because exposure to art is so important. You know, it's very interesting because if I uh, if I compare a lot of the comments that were made over the previous 10 webcasts, one thing that comes out loud and clear is exactly what the two of you say, which is even though there are serious obstacles imposed by society, et cetera, on Asian Americans in many different professions, there's no question about it. We also have to recognize that many of the obstacles are self-created, that, that, that people are not aggressive enough or they decide that they, they, they shouldn't succeed. This came across where there was Gary Locke talking about government service where he said not enough Asian Americans uh, try to run for office or in investment banking or legal, all the ones that we, we covered. So uh, we can't discount uh, the societal barriers that exist uh, you know, uh, but you, you have to, we all have to recognize that some of these things we can fix ourselves, right? Absolutely. Yeah, we need to do it. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. I think it's easier, though, if we can do it en masse. 
Let, uh -huh. Like let's, we need a larger mass um, because yes, we can say that it, it, we can all do it and take our own individual role, but it's a lot scarier to do that. We need to get others side by side and create that on mass sentiment. You know, it's very interesting that the, the cases of blatant, you know, strange discrimination, you know, for example, <laughs> I never could understand why, you know, uh, uh, certain parts in certain movies and plays that were an Asian character, you know, was played by Caucasian, you know. And uh, I remember Bruce Lee created the series Kung Fu, and he and all of a sudden David Carradine was the the main actor playing the Asian Kung Fu artist, which uh, you know was clearly. Uh, didn't have to be that way. If you look across, without mentioning names, if you look across the heavily Asia-themed museum, which there are many, right? There are many. And many of them are run by non-Asians. Do you believe that they that they that is a product of barriers or discrimination, or do you just happen to believe those people who are the most qualified for that job, independent of the theme of the museum? Jay, defer to you first. Oh, <laughs> Peter, what I was waiting for Peter to get, I don't want to jump ahead of you. I okay, go ahead, Jay. Yeah, I don't want to uh, actually, let me complicate it, the issue a little bit. Okay. You know, I think, uh, so first of all, there are not many museums devoted to Asian art, and uh, but many general museums have the Asian art department. So the Asian art is broadly represented in many museums. But, you know, museums specialized or devoted to Asian art are relatively few. But also, I must say that uh, Asian art museum is not only about Asia. We explore Asia's global relationship. We explore Asian arts relevant to American life. So we are a global museum with an Asian perspective. We're only focused on connections, right? So that's what, but I would say that there's actually nothing wrong for a non-Asian to run an Asian museum. Let me be blunt again, because Asian for all, then my vision is for the Asian, Asian art culture should be a vibrant, essential component of American life. Asia has become an essential part of American life, economically speaking, not culturally and artistically. And this is our challenge, this is our opportunity. It's great that we have a more Asian American leaders, not only leading the Asian art museums, but also general museums. That's I think I would love to see that in the, in the next generation. Same time, there's nothing wrong for a non-Asian to run an Asian organization because we need allyship. Right. We need experts who really, you know, it's not about your skin color, it's about your identity, about your passion. But if that selection of that director is biased because of the culture bias, then there's something wrong about it. I see. I think yep. that's a good point. That's a very good point. Nancy, any comment yeah. on what Jay said? Y yes, uh, Jay, wonderfully articulated. Agree with you 100%. And the only color I'd add from my vantage point is, you know, what's the difference between someone asking me uh, when I was 10 years old, if I know Kung Fu, someone asking me if I'm 22 years old and I understand the cross-strait relationship, someone asking me when I'm 35 years old, if you know, I'm familiar with all Asian American films and know every, um, you know, uh, every film fried by Zhang Yimou, which I happen to, but that's not the point. There's the same type of stereotyping and assumptions. So exactly echoing Jay's sentiment, we are looking for experts to do this work. Um, if Charlotte Brooks was to become the president of the Museum of Chinese America, given her incredible Asian American, Chinese American studies work and research at Baruch CUNY, amazing. If, if someone else is an expert in Asian art um, and, and uh, understands it, of course, the expert needs to trump the uh, subjective individual. Because if we actually put someone who's subjective into a position like this, we discount the content that was in, with, is within the walls of that institution, that organization. So absolutely need the best person. And is there some subjectivity that could lend and support someone who has objective scholarship? Absolutely. So do I feel like my career has really led me to this point where I'm at MOCA and I've taken 25 years of looking at US China, looking at US Asia, looking at Asian American issues, you know, writing in this area and then supplementing it with my own um, uh, subjective upbringing and personal experiences. 
I, I do feel like those are those those complement and that's useful, but I need to take my subjectivity and understand it from an objective lens um, and with some scholarship around that uh, that space. You know, it's interesting what the two of you said actually caused me also to think about another issue, which is um, the skills within a museum and an arts organization are not the same depending upon what your job is. You know, so obviously, if you're just the content, you know, curator or, or, or whatever, there, there's a heavy emphasis on a certain kind of leadership, but it's on the content. As you get higher up and now you have to fundraise, so forth, the different set of, not, not always the same skills, right? And I'm sure the two of you, your, your, your favorite thing every morning when you get up is let me try to raise some more money, right? You know, that's, that's probably, that's, you, you, you live for that, right? But it, that's a different kind of skill than say, if you're a world leading expert on, you know, uh, Japanese screens or whatever it may be, right? So talk a little bit about that and whether that is a factor or not. Is it different depending upon, because there are many different jobs within arts and museum organizations, right? There's the top job, obviously, which is a blend of you know, content and fundraising and management and so forth. There, but there's marketing and, and you know, there are a lot of different jobs uh, involved. So can you reflect a little bit about the different jobs within and whether different skill sets have something to do with this Asian American career ceiling issue? So I will ask Nancy to take it because she has much more <laughs> horizontally broader scope. <laughs> I okay. Well, <laughs> what, 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 what Jay is really saying is he probably knows we have a 13 person staff and like everyone has to wear 10 hats. Uh, you know, Again, I feel that the position that I'm in today, the really privileged place I am today because I have the honor of really trying to put together the Chinese American journey and make it accessible for all. Uh, the word Chinese is not in the, uh, the mission statement of the Museum of Chinese in America and that's very intentional because what we really are doing here is adding the Chinese American journey to the overall American narrative um, and that everything that's happening today is not just a moment but that it's based on a systematic need to change and redefine the American narrative to boldly include um, each and every one of your stories within this narrative. So across the board on development, I think it's tricky, tricky, tricky. And this is part of the reason why this is the toughest job I've ever had. Chinese American philanthropy is also, if I, can, if I may suggest, nascent. Um, there are a lot of articles more recently about uh, Chinese American uh, philanthropy or Chinese philanthropy or you know, transnational Chinese philanthropy to institutions, educational institutions. Um, and those articles sometimes appropriately, sometimes inappropriately suggest that it's a tit for tat. But if we, you know, in the Judeo-Christian realm and maybe perhaps in some er other areas, and that also does include Asian Americans and Asians in some way, but there is a habit of tithing. There is a habit of, of giving that is 10%. Um, I think Chinese American philanthropy being really in the development stages um, and also just given some hiccups along the way with the Sichuan earthquake, as many of you remember, and the negative publicity around um, how people squandered donations that were given in that effort um, and other types of distrust with not-for-profits, it actually um, it hinders the growth of Asian American organizations. It definitely hinders the growth of MOCA. Uh, we, in our situation, uh, we definitely need to partner uh, because I think we have to meet people where they are in terms of their philanthropic desires and passions. It is much easier to, for me, I, I went previously at Yale China Association, fundraising was much, much easier there. Um, there was a partnership there at the Council on Foreign Relations. It was, it was definitely uh, something that seemed less like an uphill, but at MOCA, it's really been quite difficult. Um, one, because of the nascent state of the Chinese American philanthropy, but two, because of suspicion and then three, really understanding that there is a benefit. There is a social return on philanthropic investment. And I am so convinced, which is why people are like, why did you go to MOCA? I said, I am convinced that MOCA will change your trajectory of your life, your children's life and your grandchildren's life. I am placing, I am long on MOCA to do that for each and every one of us. And not just people of Chinese ancestry, people in America because the narrative is flawed, it's incomplete. And I believe that the partnership around this to make MOCA a stable 
in perpetuity, flourishing organization and museum that tells this journey will benefit all. And, and, but it's hard because philanthropy is difficult. And across the board, we wear 10 hats at any one person in this. We serve 50,000 people. We're going to serve 200,000 people in about four years. But the, the, the per person <laughs> to per visitor is just obscene. The ratios, no one do this exercise, but the ratios at MOCA in terms of people served and number of people who work here, how much is raised is, you, you've never seen these ratios um, and it's impossible work. But at the same time, I promise you, it is going to change your children and your grandchildren's life if MOCA can be a flourishing museum among many. And just the last point on that, the, the, we're, we're on our way. So the Ford Foundation just designated MOCA as one of 20 of America's cultural treasures in the entire country. We're the only museum of Chinese ancestry that's within this, uh, within this realm of 20 organizations. And it's, it's, it's starting to turn and, and, and we need to believe in it because it will happen. I promise you it will happen. You know, Jay, not, yeah. Nancy has always the, had the problem but she doesn't have much passion for what she does. <laughs> <laughs> have you noticed that? I mean, oh, uh, I've known her for many I'm years. So well. she, she, she barely has any enthusiasm for what she does. Yeah. Dave, you want to comment? Ying Ying hearing her uh, her passion and uh, and the comment. So I would say that um, the museum director job is fundamentally a learn on the job job, and most of the museum director came through the rank of art historians. I'm talking about art museum as an example, and uh, nobody going to teach you how to be a fundraiser, nor how to be a legal expert. Now how to, again, your financial acumen, right? And know how to manage people. You learn on the job. So the museum director fundamentally is a high impact and a high challenge job. But why do I love it? Because it's elevate or open a vista that I have never had experienced before. That I have so many human partners that I can work together and learn from them and then put my contribution and to help to shape the culture life of our community. And by that extension, the nation and the global. So it is a wonderfully rewarding job. I remember very distinctly, just give you one example. When I was interviewed for this job, I was asked by the search committee, say, Jay, we have a particular need for the executive director of Asia Museum to be a top fundraiser. You have your curatorial and artistic experience, no right. doubt. You have never participated in any sort of big ticket fundraising activity. How can you convince us to hire you? Great question. So my answer, I did not remember exact words, something like this. I think it is a foregone conclusion for the university presidents or museum directors to fundraise. But I don't think fundraising is a transaction. It's all about relationship building. And I think I'm good at building relationships. In the end, it's all about communication and your capacity to learn your curiosity, your willingness to give it 120% or more. To be and, and talking to people and having them have a shared passion for what you have a passion for. You so, know, I, I won't mention name, but I'm, my wife and I are close friends with someone who is the head of a very famous uh, music organization and he was recruited to be the head and he was petrified because he was running a much smaller organization and I remember when we had dinner with him he said for the first couple of weeks I was petrified about what it was going to re require to raise the now much greater amount of money right and he said I finally said you know I'm just going to uh, talk about what I love, which is music and, and, and sharing with people. And if that touches the other person's heart, that is the way I'll do it. But that's the only way I'm most comfortable. And, Absolutely. Uh, yeah. Because, you know, in the end of the day, it is all about storytelling, genuinely passionate stories that we can convey. And I think uh, we can be pretty good at it. And uh, so, and I'm a uh, just as a sidebar or as a joke, I should copyright uh, this expression. You know, this expression is very common, right? You know, um, the, uh, oh, give me a second. Uh, a state of the art. Right. Everybody 
business. So, you know, we're in the Silicon Valley. It's part of my job to really cultivate that, the, uh, that uh, uh, ecosystem and a lot of entrepreneurs. So sometimes I talk to CEOs in Silicon Valley. I say, you have such a great product. Sometimes how do you advertise it? Don't you say, my product is a state of the art. I say, absolutely. You're so good. You had to borrow my word to describe how good you are. <laughs> that defines what the meaning and the status, significance of art in our community, in our life, individually and collectively, because art defines who we are as humans. So don't you think you should support us for what are we doing? Yeah. <laughs> I, th- you know, I have a low, low, low brow compliment to uh, Jay's highbrow uh, analogy, which is, you know, you've seen maybe some shirts that say, Earth without art is just eh. <laughs> E-H, yeah. eh. <laughs> so that's a lowbrow version of what you just said. Now I have two more questions that I want to pose to you before we go to the Q&A. The first one is I'd like each of you to mention what are the three biggest barriers, career ceiling barriers, for Asian Americans in arts and museum management. What are the what are the three most significant barriers that that uh, that you see? Okay, I think there's the institutional and the individualized uh, barriers. The first mm-hmm. one I was always say the organization, the our systemic prejudice and the racism and the white privilege mm-hmm. is the largest barrier. There's just uh, Asian Americans as a community are marginalized. And the individual Asian leaders often case are pigeonholed. You are doing great with your Asian things. Yeah. But in the general large organization, maybe. maybe and yeah. this actually the biases are not only uh, 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 harbored, let's say by the white community. It's also, you know, it's a self-imposed as well. And the second, I think the individual is that, you know, uh, the interest in management work has not been as broad as I, my personal experience, observation has seen. And also sort of the, uh, the confidence in terms of going to that field and willing uh, to make a difference, you know, because of, I think, a lot of the cultural traditions and uh, in, in East Asia, particularly the confusion uh, uh, the upbringing and the traditions and, uh, uh, and the respect for hierarchy, these may be unconsciously impacted a lot of uh, the psyche of the Asian American. Yeah, uh, and I, Jay, Jay, and Jay, I think you make a good point and, and maybe part of it is a passage of time that when Asian Americans first immigrated here, they tended to gravitate towards certain jobs and then gradually shift to other jobs and I do think that part of this evolution will be a willingness to consider professions that they hadn't thought were necessarily either acceptable to their Asian moms and dads or, or, or penetrable, right? And I think that's part of it. So Nancy, three most important obstacles for the, related to the, the Asian American career team. Lack of risk, uh, legitimacy, uh, both of which uh, Jay alluded to. And I think the last one is, is the mystery about not-for-profits. So a lot of arts and cultural organizations and institutions are in the not-for-profit sector. Right. And if you scroll down any list of, okay, what profession are you? You'll have every profession from aerospace, engineering, education, teaching, and then there'll be one line that says not-for-profit. And I think this elusiveness about what that is, whereas not-for-profit actually encapsulates all of those other sectors. There's always some space in which um, those institutions, and I think that there's a little bit of an unknown and because we've created a a certain path uh, that's more more popular that certain other ones do not seem like they are um, going to maintain a quality of life, uh, can help support multiple generations, um, and have all the burdens of a quality of life. And Jay, you said earlier, making a life. And that's exactly what we're calling one of the sections of our museum. The part that we've researched a lot is the, the, the Chinese American journey and the ways in which we have made a life. 
and I find it to be so fascinating that there has been so much, as we say in Chinese, uh, 自苦, right? eat bitterness. Um, there's this, this eat bitterness part. There's this 当自己的老板, like be your own boss. Um, there, there are these trends within the making of life that are so risky, but at the same time, for some reason on this formulaic, um, a sort of the way we think about it is less risky. So there's a misalignment with risk in terms of the maybe the Chinese philosophical measure of risk versus the U.S. version of risk. It's it's almost like a misalignment, and so um, I, I think that that is a societal imposition on, on on one's ability to pursue arts and culture because of this very different, um, very misaligned sense of risk taking. Yeah, it's it's a convoluted sense, but yeah, that's. And I certainly would add one other thing, which is, which is true for all the professions, I think, is that the style, management style, the natural management style of Asian Americans is generally, and it's changing, you know, study hard, work hard, and then people will recognize you for it. Whereas in, in the US, which you know, is different from other parts of the world, there's a much more aggressive style of management it, through most professions, right? And that's one of the things that's changing as generation after generation evolves among Asian Americans. So my last and favorite question is, what advice would each of you give to those people in the audience who obviously are in, they're in different stages uh, of, of, of the field, different fields at different stages of their career. What advice would you give to them relative to this career ceiling issue? And I'll let either one of you decide to go to per go first. Nancy first. No, Jay first. <laughs> oh, oh, oh. <laughs> All right. Um, I actually have been reflecting a lot on this. And because I'm very interested in uh, mentoring, I myself want to continue to be mentored. And in my own course, I hope that uh, whatever my experience has been uh, be useful to others, particularly next generations, I think uh, they certainly come out much stronger than our generation, be more assertive. I don't really call aggressive, but assertive with the confidence. I think this is what means. So my first advice is self-confidence. You must believe in yourself for what you are going to do. The second, I would say, focus on the big picture. Don't be caught up with every injury. So throughout the journey, you're going to be hurt. You're going to be feel injured here and there. But some battle you need to fight, some battle you need to save your energy. So focus on the big picture. Be very clear about what you want to accomplish and how you can uh, 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 overcome the obstacle. The third is find the allies. Allies from all corners. And broader base, support base you have, the better chance you're gonna be su successful. The fourth is that work hard. You have to be prepared because we are still a members of a marginalized society with so much up here battle to fight. We have to give in at 120%, 200% in order to make a difference. Well, those, are, those are very good pieces of advice. Nancy, your advice to the audience? Don't call Jay before I call him to ask him to be my mentor. <laughs> no, that's not um, no I, I think this is going to, you know, mine are, my, mine are tactical. And I think it's, this is going to sound very strange, but this is just the way, you know, when I was interested in developing a craft, I used my Hongbao money, my red envelope money, and I took a course. And this was years ago, 20 years ago. And I wanted to my homebound money is always what I try to do in terms of something I'm passionate and love. And I keep it until I know what I want to spend it on. And that's just an analogy for saying, you can still if you know what your beta is, what your measure for volatility is, what your risk level is. Because some people may want to continue in their nine to five, whatever more conventional position, but they have a passion for something else. This is not a new story, but invest in that passion. Um, and you can do it and measure your risk. And then, you know what? Challenge the structure that you're in. Perhaps you hy hypothetically have a nine to five job, but maybe hypothetically, you are going to take a sacrifice and say, I'm just gonna work 80% of the week, boss. Can I take one day off a week and make an investment in that passion? Because you have to measure your risk. And other people might say, you know what? I'm just gonna drop it. 
I have a little bit of savings and I'm just going to pursue it and see how this works out. But I trust you. I, I trust me. And when I say this, probably most likely your skills are transferable in more ways than you realize. And it does it on, on, across all sectors. And that's why I started with the notion of, I realized more recently that I'm a utility player, but that's the benefit, the competitive advantage I had, and I'm not going to suggest everyone had, but being an Asian American growing up in New York City in the 70s and 80s, in some ways, yes, I was told to go down a more narrow, less risk, risky um, uh, path. But what it made me was a utility player. So yeah. now I work at a museum. And I could not be happier echoing Jay's sentiments about the creativity, the art, but using my skills and all of that. Um, and I just think, know your risk level and then challenge the structure and try to get and engage your, your passion to make some change. So let's turn to questions for the audience. We have a, a number of them. The first one says, Nancy and Jay, can you be more specific about the stepping stones with this career path, meaning a, a career path in arts and museum management, what are they and how can people go on such a track? Does going to go, go to elite schools, question mark? So they really wanna know what are the stepping stones that you would like to identify for them if you wanna have a successful career in managing the arts and museum? Um, if I um, come to immediately, uh, the in, if you are very early in exploring the career, internship is really important. That give you the exposure and you're already in the arts profession, like in the museum setting, try to participate in institutional-wide task force or projects that beyond your regular job description. If you want to move towards the management, that give you more exposure and assert your leadership. Grab every opportunity, big or small, that you can learn and assert your leadership. That is the stepping stone. Nancy, any comment? Read, 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 visit, visit, visit. You need your due diligence. Um, that is so important. You need to know the language. You need to get the glossary. And I think that those things sometimes we overlook. That is not always transferable. So make sure that you are reading the content and you're obtaining and doing your due diligence. By the way, a short story. You know, when I was at Harvard Business School, there was one student in my section who uh, would always miss class. And we would find him sitting in front of cafes and restaurants, watching the people, looking at the menu and so forth. And we had to drag him back to class so he wouldn't flunk out. And, and ultimately he became, he started all bon pan and Panera bread. And the, the mess in there was, and I don't know whether he learned anything from Harvard Business School, probably not. But the key to his success was that he really understood, like Jay said, really tried to understand the insides of restaurant operations and so forth. And uh, it's funny, he probably got the worst grades of anyone in my class, but uh, no one disputes the fact that he did quite well. Next question is, do you have any experiences and or input to share about navigating through the North American model minority narrative in both your careers and the museum programming that you do. Uh, and this is actually coming from someone who says that they're an uh, Asian Canadian museum professional. So, so they're in the profession. You sort of answered this already, but I think I felt this is coming from someone who's obviously in the midst of a career in, in museum. I guess directly, if you are in a situation where the model minority myth is you're getting some sort of sniff of it in your interactions, my own thinking right now these days is just to call it out, um, not to call it aggressively, not, not just call it out. And I think the more we identify it and talk about it and um, understand what that looks like, I think the, the, the better it will be uh, for, for you and for others who come after you. Uh, but we need to we need to stand out and we need to call it out. And yeah, yeah I could go on for about uh, that, that quite a bit, but the do not succumb to stereotype, whether they be positive or negative. Yeah, I feel that you know, for the Asia Art Museum, uh, we um, have a large room to grow 
in particularly, you know, to uh, help develop uh, the Asian American narratives and uh, with a truly basic history. You know, so one way of doing it is through partnerships. And the other is most importantly, equally important, is to give artistic voices. For example, in our museum right now, we have a video program called After Hope. We have about 50 or more artists from a very diverse background. Some are directly in Asia, some are Asian Americans, to tell about the struggles of uh, Asians in the international community as well as Asian American in America. I think through those kind of artistic interventions that we can really help develop a balanced narratives. Yes, Asians can be very successful, but also Asians as a community have tremendous suffering going on at the same time. And we need to look at it holistically and really break up the uh, model ma minority myth. This next question is rather interesting, actually. And, uh, and uh, someone asks, mainstream cultural institutions have limited representations of the Asian and Asian American experiences. Shouldn't these institutes be told to have more Asian representatives representation in their permanent collection? This kind of harkens a little bit to Jay, what you were saying, which is so much 60% of the population the culture is Asian, but it's only a small part of what's displayed in museums and arts. So maybe this is like affirmative action for Asian art and experiences, right? Any comments? Yeah, I think, uh, you know, raising voices is absolutely important, but the voices and actions need to come hand in hand. As I said, you know, for in institutionalized large arts organizations in this nation, exceedingly wide. And you can not only look at management, but look at the board, right? The board is also very exceedingly wide. So I think uh, making those kind of uh, rightful demands for diversity, inclusion, equity is very important, but also at the same time, we as Asian community, we need to vote with our wallets. You know, we need to send board members to sit on those board to provide philanthropic resources and in doing so also make demands. I think uh, we need to both asking for institutional reform, but also we must actively participate in that reform. I think uh, nothing will be truly great if it's only handed up and, and, and say, you know, because often the case it could be tokenized, right? And what we need is a systemic fundamental change for diversity and inclusion. And, and I'll add to that, Peter, just, you know, one of the, I guess, a, an accomplishment I feel like I've had um, at MOCA was actually something not related to MOCA directly, but that McGraw Hill, uh, the textbook uh, publishing house, just created an equity advisory board. And I joined it as one of six members. And I feel that that's going to help in some ways the Chinese American narrative and other groups and marginalized communities more in some ways because it will reach 25 million people, young people in this country. And exactly what Jay said, and Jane Chu was just on a MOCA program and she made the great analogy of, you know, the, the, the dead bodies keep going down the stream, but you got to fix the bridge because they keep falling through the bridge hole. And I think that there's a Chinese idiom around that too. But also I think we have a very complicated and problematic issue right now because Asian Americans, Chinese Americans are still considered perpetually foreign and because transnationalism and Asians are more transnational than ever before in the history, we have this conflict. So the Met had the fourth most popular exhibit was China Through the Looking Glass. That year, it had 800,000 visitors to the Met. And is that considered in some people's eyes a check the box on the Asian American art space or the Asian American, uh, no, it, it's not, it's, it's definitely a, 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 you know, China through the looking class, it's contemporary uh, fashion, art, and different aspects of that presented at the Met. But the, 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 the Asian American narrative sometimes continues to get lost as we see Asians still as perpetually foreign in this country and with the, with the more prevalent state of Asian transnationals in this country. And I think that that's a very tricky, tricky space that we need to be distinct about those two populations. Yeah, yeah, actually, well, there's a yeah. a, there is a question here from Henry Tang that actually directly relates to what you're talking about. You know, before we were talking about self-imposed barriers because 
of behavioral barriers. But Henry Tang says, how about stereotypes which inhibit, right? And to what extent are there stereotypes that affect, create this uh, career ceiling in your professions and how do people overcome them? Yeah, I think uh, I uh, alluded to stereotype like, uh, you know, in the very concrete action of pigeonholing, Asian certainly, you know, uh, good at certain things or, you know, in general societal issues like uh, STEM, you are very good at STEM, but you know, uh, this is all you are interested in or something. So I think stereotype certainly uh, is there and it's uh, hard to dismantle, but I think bit by bit we're doing this. So actually I want to finish a, a little bit of thought related to the previous question. I want to particularly appeal to the members of the Asian American community and the Chinese American community that are doing exceedingly well and including members of our Committee of 100. Many of them are wonderful philanthropists, but we can do more. We can do much more. And through doing much more then to can also help demand the changes. At the same time, the whole community needs to raise further voices. So I think that those stereotypes, back to your question, certainly existed and a very well known probably. There's an, and and that it's a matter of how we effectively go about dismantling them. Yeah. No, and, and, uh, yeah, yeah. Go ahead. Oh, go and ahead. Uh, I was going yeah. to say, yeah, close out, but go ahead. Okay. Just, just I think the adding to that is we cannot act in a vacuum, and 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 that's one of the things that the dangers of it. The Asian American advocacy organizations, yes, we're we're speaking loud and clear, and yet we act sometimes in a vacuum. And I think that's why we need to look for vehicles and museums can be a vehicle because it reaches a broad swath of people. And that ensures that we're not just talking to ourselves in a vacuum because that won't help dismantle the stereotype. We often, we have at any time between 10 and two o'clock before COVID, you would see upwards 200, 300 students here. And sometimes not one Asian person, Asian ancestry person because this is going to fourth graders, to eighth graders, to 11th graders, to high school students, to college students. You need to look for vehicles where you can actually make a change and challenge those stereotypes and inform and educate, whether it's in the classroom, around the boardroom, um, you know, in museums, in arts and cultural institutions. And I think that that's critical. I implore on all, everyone on this call, do not speak in a vacuum. You know, have the uncomfortable conversations with people that you don't necessarily want to. Now, since I promised that we would end on time, uh, I apologize for those of you who posed questions that we haven't been able to get to. However, I hope all of you agree that these two panelists really, in a very dynamic way, have shed a lot of light around this issue of the Asian American career sailings in arts and museums. I want to thank both of you for agreeing to do this and, uh, and for really being very helpful to the audience. Uh, and I just want to remind all of you that we, on April uh, 27th, we're going to have a very different uh, webcast with two experts who really examined uh, to what extent are these career ceilings different depending upon ethnicity and what it's really driving it. So thank you very much, Jay, and thank you very much, Nancy. And uh, all of you in the audience, if you haven't gone to their two institutions, you must go. Uh, so I encourage you to do so. So thank you all and uh, wish you all good night. Thank you, Peter. Thank you, Thanks, Peter. everyone. Thank you, Jay. Yes. Wonderful. Thank to you, talk. everyone. Okay. Go to the Asian Art Museum and go to visit Nancy's museum. <laughs> MOCA, everyone's Mocha. museum. Yes, <laughs> okay. Museum. Yeah.